Hello there and welcome to part two of this appraisal of coated shaft irons mainly from the 1930s, 40s and 50s. In part one we looked at woods and in this part we'll be looking mainly at irons with a quick look at some putters. I'll try and post the link to part one up in the top right corner. Let's uh, start part two. On to the irons then. Uh, we're going to start with three hickory clubs just so that we can see what was going on before the first steel shafts came out. Uh, these are all um, dating post 1900 uh, so there's nothing really old here. The first one is a uh, Willy Park, if I can get that in the light. There we go, can we see that there? Willie Park of Musselburgh, this would be Willie Park Jr. It might just be um, 1900s, but I don't think it is. It's a smooth face club, uh, lines and dot faces started to appear um, in the, the 1900s, possibly even slightly before that. Uh, and it's a typical hickory club. This would be referred to as a clique, uh, so it's a, a long iron. Um, I, I did reshaft this one so the shaft looks very clean. The next one we've got is a Tom Stewart club. Uh, Tom Stewart's pipe mark, his cleat mark was a pipe. There we are, so we've got a pipe there and we can see TS, STA, which was Tom Stewart, St Andrews. Um, and the club has been produced and sold and Finished off by the professional here, who was a Mr. Robertson, based at Whitley Bay Golf Club. Special, um, it's just something that was used to make the owner think that they were getting a, a special club. Uh, and then we've got the club name, which is a Mashi, and this is a number two Mashi. Mashi's uh, covered all sorts of lofts and sizes. There were deep face Mashi's um, and ve very many different lofts. You can see we've, we've now got a lined face and this one has got quite a, a wide sole uh, it's a nice club uh, I've not actually played it yet because I need to reset the head but it should certainly give a good launch on the ball uh, so very nice club but again we can see it's still a very simple design just a flat blade slight taper from top to bottom the next one I include around about this time before I move on to this one there were uh, a few innovations going on with um, the weighting of clubs we were starting to see um, metal being placed in certain areas of the club to um, aid the the flight of the ball the commonest thing was to increase the amount of weight at the at the center which thinking at the time was that that would give you a better strike and if you hit the sweet spot that was very much the case but if you missed the sweet spot it, it, it wasn't a help at all uh, which is why we've seen the uh, the current um, cavity irons dominating the market because they move the, the weight away from the center to the edges which means that you get a, 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 a well, less um, loss of distance when you miss the sweet spot uh, a typical common um, variations at the time as I say were to have weight centered um, in the middle of the club and that might be a raised portion uh, in a diamond pattern so we have uh, almost like a very flat pyramid which would be called a diamond back um, we're also starting to see what were called muscle back clubs uh, and that muscle um, was the shellfish mu double s e double l uh, so it looked like a muscle on the back of the a muscle muscle shell on the back of the club um, and again that was to position weight in a certain area that became um, changed over the years to the muscle we, we know today m-u-s-c-l-e uh, why that happened I, I assume it was because it, it sold better and people were happier buying a club that was a, a muscle club as opposed to a shellfish club anyway that's just a by the by so coming on to this one then this is quite a significant club um, and it's the produced by uh, FHAs and it's the uh, 
DW brand. Now, what that stood for, uh, I've no idea, and I've not found anybody that has been able to say either. But it's basically it's a uh, so it's not overly emphasised on this one. Um, but we've got a reasonable bit of weight at the bottom, but then we've got some more weight at the top, and that would assist with a, a low penetrating flight for the shot. So very nice for Lynx play. So that's the three hickory clubs we're looking at. Uh, let's get some coated shaft clubs in now. Okay, we've now got eight uh, coated shaft irons here. Proper table of delights. We'll start uh, on the left-hand side. And this is one that uh, goes after a style that I mentioned previously in the Wilson video. And that's the... Uh, augmented style. Uh, this one doesn't actually say uh, Willy Og on it, but we can see that there's a large um, piece of uh, weighting uh, added to the toe there, which moves the, the weight away from the hosel uh, and moves the centre of gravity more towards the toe. Um, early clubs with long hosels <coughs> and not very heavy blades tended to have the sweet spot quite close to the hosel. Um, and we all know what uh, what can happen when we're, we're hitting close to the hosel. Well, I do anyway. Uh, this is a, a St Andrews Golf uh, Company club um, who Willie Og did work for for a while. So quite an innovative model here. And it's also got quite an unusual shaft. We can see here it tapers down and looks very much like a hickory shaft. Uh, there's no uh, ferrule on there. It's all one piece. There should be a, a, a black plastic band around there, but it's fallen off on this one. Um, but it does enable us to see uh, how thick that uh, coating is there. I'm not sure what this material is. I don't think this one's pyrotone. It feels slightly softer than that. But also of interest, as we get towards the end of the club, we can see... Whether I can transit, show that in the light, it transitions from being round to hexagonal about this point here. So we can see as I roll that, we can see the different sides. So it's a, quite an interesting shaft all round, really. A nice leather grip there. But I, I was talking about experimentation and different styles. The OW model moving the weight towards the toe. Uh, this club, which is interesting in many ways, uh, goes the exact opposite. Uh, there's very little weight on the toe and a large chunk of additional weight we can see on the heel here. So this would be moving the weight towards the hosel. Um, and as I say, that's a, a, a recipe for disaster for me. Um, looking at the club, it, it, it has the appearance of a, a hickory club in many ways. Quite a wide hosel at the top. So you can easily imagine a hickory shaft going in there. Now this is actually what's called uh, a no-shock hosel. I don't know what it says on this one. No, it doesn't. But the patent number refers to that, or the registered number, and the accuracy uh, or the wizard part of this name uh, often refers to the fact that it's a no-shock hosel. And what we've got here is a, a steel shaft, which then goes into a collar within the hosel. And the idea was, um, when steel shafts first came out, there was quite a bit of resistance against them because they were felt to be uh, not as uh, a soft feeling as a hickory shaft um, so this no shock hosel as the name suggests was designed to um, reduce the jarring effect of a steel shaft now, whether that's just marketing or not um, well we, we can't really say um, there was quite a long debate about whether this head was designed to accept a hickory or a steel shaft because it's got such a, a wide neck. It looks as though it would easily take a hickory shaft. But some excellent research by Ian Forrester has pretty much disproved that theory. Although you do often see these converted to hickory shafts um, because they'll, they'll fetch a lot more money if they are uh, a hickory shaft. But uh, I've kept this one as it was. Uh, and there we go. So that's the Nickel um, Accuracy Wizard Club. Put that one back around there. I'm waffling quite a bit here. I'm going to have to get a move on, otherwise this will be such a long video. Nobody will be have the patience to watch it to the end. <laughs> this one, I'm not sure who made it. We've got Fred Stevens, which would be the pro's name. Matched set. Um, matched set started to come out. In the early steel shafted in even in the early hickory days sorry the late hickory days and that would be when rather than buying your clubs piecemeal people bought the whole set 
and the, the clubs would be matched to have the same weight and swing weight, uh, punched up face, <coughs> excuse me, and a nice uh, attractive ferrule there. And then coming on to the next one, it's a, a very attractive head, uh, a Gradage club, as I said in a, uh, uh, I think the last video I made, Gradage was bought by um, Slazenger and they started production for of golf clubs, at least for Slazenger. Slazenger had been making golf balls, but they hadn't made any golf clubs um, and Gradage was their entry into that market. Uh, made in Great Britain, hand forged in London. So I'm pretty sure that dates it to uh, pre-war because uh, Gradage's Woolwich factory in London was hit by incendiary bombs in the war and production after the war moved to the Horbury factory in West Yorkshire. We've got the pro's name there, <coughs> uh, Crookshank, uh, and we can see the sole of this club is very thin. Uh, these are some of the um, thinnest soles I've, I've got. Uh, it's almost, well, the epitome of a butter knife, this one. But it does have a nice, uh, not quite a, a wingback's uh, design, um, but a very nice uh, bit of a sculpting there on the back. Uh, almost Art Deco in style, these ones. The crown there was Gradage's cleat mark, and it was also used by Slazinger uh, as well. So, very nice club, that one. We'll then move on to the next one. And this is, uh, I think you could call this one a muscle back. It's, it's definitely a rounded back, so like a muscle shell. Uh, peak high, I've already mentioned um, that this came from the Derbyshire. Uh, Buxton area. Um, Sid Warren Green is the professional there. Uh, this is a number four iron. We've got the registered design there so we could find that um, if we did enough research and track down the registration number. Uh, unfortunately as I say I mean these are a beautiful set. Lined face so they're a bit of a transitional club. Um, true temper dynamic shaft so whether they were 1930s or 1940s, it's difficult to say. But again, we've got that True Temper Ladies Flex shaft. Nice grips again. Super plus four grips made in England. And overall, extremely attractive club. And we then got <coughs> the matching iron to the uh, fork and par shot wood that I showed. Um, again, we've got a nice bit of uh, sole weighting going on here, uh, lined face again, so again as I say it's, it's hard to say whether this was a 1930s or a, or a carryover to the 1940s, possibly even the early 1950s, uh, nice ferrule there and again we've got a medium flex shaft and it's an Apollo shaft. We've then got uh, this design here which there was a, a time when these uh, large um, grooves on the sole uh, were quite popular. Uh, I think it was the, the 1930s, late 1930s. Um, today, I'd guess that the marketing guys would say that it gave excellent turf interaction. Um, I doubt whether such phrases were around then. Uh, this club, I'm pretty sure, is a 1930s design. John Letters, Coney Ridge. Uh, with a John Letters cleat mark there and what have we got on the bottom there hand forged in Scotland nice green ferrule somebody's um, cleaned these up a little bit more than I would like to have seen and the the green paint feel is not what I imagine the original colour was it's a little bit garish that is um, but nice nice club um, fairly crude punch dot face and the shaft on this one is another uh, plain shaft. The grip, as you can see, it's a very old uh, hard grip. This has got what we call a reminder um, line down the back there. So you can position your fingers on it and know you're holding the, the, the grip square. Um, but it, it's, it's seen better days, let's say. So I have an advert for this one from a, <clears throat> an open program, which I'll bring up. Um, and that was a post-war program, so they were certainly producing these again after the war, as I've said several times by now. Um, golf club production after the war relied very much on what was going on before the war. 
uh, industry was hit so hard um, in fact the whole country was and it took a long time to recover and new designs to start to appear you can see the four there placed at the uh, angle on the toe uh, so nice club um, and I think that might be the ones that I played because I'm going to play a set of these um, but moving on to the last club Glen Fog made in Scotland I know nothing about this name whether it was um, an actual uh, company uh, whether it was a brand name I don't know there's no other name on there it says Rustless made in Scotland Glen Fog I'd imagine it was a brand name uh, dot face there nice uh, lines there uh, black ferrule black shaft uh, so let's see what the shaft is Yep. So it's a, a true temper shaft, if we can get that into focus. Possibly, possibly not. Oh, I've shown enough shafts anyway. Uh, and again, the design, um, a lot of weight at the bottom, and a slight bulge at the top there. But not quite the DW design, but getting close to it. So there we've got four... Um, attractive uh, coated shaft clubs and I think these are well worth collecting uh, it's hard to find a, a full set uh, odds can be picked up very easily um, the shafts are the main thing to look at uh, 1930s 1940s we're, we're over 70 years old for most of these getting on for 100 years for some of them so corrosion if they've not been stored well can be an issue uh, before I move on I mentioned the DW brand um, and the fact that it did reappear it, it sort of semi disappeared from uh, British clubs um, in the 30s and early 1940s obviously nothing was happening in the early 1940s but we did see things like this uh, Glen Farg one and the Fred Stevens one there but after the war um, well, it, it all comes down to Tommy Armour who went to, Scot uh, to America um, before or uh, between the wars and he took I believe a few clubs with him and the <clears throat> McGregor Tommy Armour design um, was produced and it was a very popular design and when some of the U British professionals went across uh, particularly Fred Daly um, and uh, Tom Halliburton perhaps they brought some of these clubs back and that's John Letters to produce them and he did so producing uh, the master model master's model and that was used in very many clubs as I've said already on various videos so I've got an example of one here this is a Slazinger ambassador and we can see there quite a bit of bottom weight and then a, a bit of weighting at the top again so that gives you a nice um, penetrating ball flight well, I think that uh, brings us to the end of the irons. Right, let's have a look at a few putters. Um, but before I do that, I've just found a, a couple more clubs we'll quickly look at. And the first is a Ben Sayers um, coated shaft again. And again, here we can see some quite uh, radical um, profile uh, going on. A bit of weight at the bottom, a very solid uh, centre band there, and a thin a bit in the middle and a, a little bit extra on the top so there was, there was some quite um, adventurous designs going on in the 1930s um, nice face on this one we've got the lines there and then the model um, Parex uh, Ben Sayers Parex if I can catch the light on that properly uh, I think you can see it there and we've got the Ben Sayers bird cleat mark and then got two clubs uh, from the same set and this is a, a gradage set made in England um, doesn't say London so whether these were produced after the war or before I would imagine uh, for a couple of reasons that these are a post-war set if we look at the four iron first I'll just move that Ben Sayers out of the way we can see it's a dot face so an early design it could have been uh, designed um, while they were producing clubs in in London um, the crown cleat mark again and the gradage name black coated steel shaft this one is let's have a look another true temper I won't bother showing you I'm sure you've seen enough uh, faded shaft names by now uh, so there we are and then we've got uh, the putter for this set 
As, as I've said previously, clubs went up to a number eight um, in the early days and then the putter was the number nine. So here we can see the number nine and this is the putter uh, matching uh, stampings and everything. Put that back there to talk about that in a minute. Then we've got a number 10. So this um, was quite a, a revolutionary club and on the top it says B out which suggests it's a recovery club. Was it a, a, a sand club? Very possibly. There is a bit of bounce on the sole, not a huge amount. Just have to take my word for it. There is a little bit of bounce on the sole and we can see that it's a lined face rather than the dot face of the other clubs. So I'd guess that this would have been um, designed after these clubs, but then it would be stamped up uh, as a matching part of the set. So, Obviously a transitional time uh, between dot face and lined face. Uh, nice club, uh, nice to see that B out on the top there. So that's those two. We'll now move on to putters. And we'll start with the gradage, because I've already talked about that one briefly. Uh, I mean, this is a, a very uh, attractive putter uh, to look at. Um, long swept head. Uh, but I've, I find it quite difficult to put with. If we look down uh, the end there and position it so that you can see, there's a very big offset on it, which I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, so I, and I also find it quite hard to find the sweet spot. So while I think it's a very nice looking putter, it's not one of the, uh, the ones that I put the best with. Uh, the same shaft as the, the rest of the set, and a dot face as well. So that's that one. We've then got this one, which is produced by Robert Forgan or Forgans, and this is a cashin putter, which was produced under license from Spalding. Uh, Spalding uh, brought out the, or it might have been another company. Um, I forget the name of. Uh, I'll bring it up in some text up here somewhere. Uh, but it, it was produced under license, the cashing design, and we can see there, uh, registered rustless, made in Scotland. So this would have been produced at Forgan's uh, St. Andrew's um, factory. The shaft on it is the one that was used quite a lot on putters. Don't see it very much on uh, other clubs. We can see it's quite a, a thin shaft at the, uh, at the bottom there compared to the other shafts um, and it's a green metallic finish on it. The grip is a, a pistol type grip. We get to take this one on the course so I can't say at all how it puts but nice putter. We've then got uh, the putter from the Peak High set as I've already shown the wood and the uh, iron for and it follows the same sort of style, muscle back style, very pronounced on this one. And again, it's a number nine uh, for the putter. And we've got Sid Warren Green signature there, peak high registered design. Very nice club. And finally, last in the coated shaft putters. As I say, these don't really differ much from uh, other putters. Uh, there was a lot of development going on. Um, this one is a flange sole putter. Uh, very good condition. We've got a frosted face, punch dot face. Frosted top line as well, and on the sole, Robert Forgan Victory Putter, and we've got the Forgan flag cleat mark there, stainless, made in Scotland. So that concludes the putters, and hopefully uh, you'll agree now that the coated shaft area has got a lot to offer collectors. Um, there are some really innovative designs, um, a lot of makers that disappeared. Um, slightly before or during or immediately after the war so there are some names that don't uh, show up uh, in post-war clubs um, but it's a very neglected area there's very little research done on it um, so yeah let's hope we can get more people interested this video is already very long so I'm going to have to make a part three to show me playing with some of these clubs on the course in the meantime, here's a quick preview of the clubs that I've chosen to use.
señor, señor, carabe que es soldado. That was pretty dramatic. I hope my play can live up to it. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this part two and you'll find time to tune into part three when it comes out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.